morning grade nines welcome to lesson three the pulley we continue today uh, where we left off last week and i hope you've done the sums uh, for pascal's hydraulic system and we'll go over those answers a little later let's turn our attention to the powerpoint presentation that you've received in your tablets the pulley i want you to realize that a pulley is a mechanical system which gives great advantage and this whole term in technology we're going to be doing systems which give us a mechanical advantage any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic what i want you to realize is that technology is linked to physics and even to maths right how does a pulley work well, we know that most heavy objects that we pick up, we pick up upwards. And that means we've got to fight against gravity. Whereas pulleys are often designed in such a way that we pull downwards, which means that we can use our weight to pull the weight upwards. There are three classes of pulleys. The single wheel pulley, and that is fixed. Then we have the single wheel pulley, which is movable and the pulley block system which is a combination of both the single wheel fixed pulley is the most basic it has a pulley with a wheel or a rope and a belt with a groove this minimizes friction the advantage gained here and the force that's multiplied is because as i explained earlier the load is lifted up and we can pull down with our weight at whatever angle we need to a more efficient pulley is called the single wheel movable pulley because now instead of having the, woolly, the pulley above, <laughs> we have it below. So over here, the weight is divided between both sets of ropes. So if this is 100 newtons, this will be 50 newtons on either side. Because the pulley runs along the rope, it disperses the force needed to carry it. The most efficient pulley system is the pulley block system. And this consists of the tackle and the block. Because we can combine a whole lot of pulleys, we will add more what we call falls to the equation. And the more amounts of rope that hold up the weight, the better your mechanical advantage. A block and tackle is very advantageous as it can carry huge weights. The disadvantages are that it takes a longer time to get to the top and it's not going to be fast. But what you lose in speed, you make up in power. Now, how does it actually create a mechanical advantage? Well, every time you add a new pulley to the system, you half the work needed so we'll look when we do a few sums later how that actually works basically the longer your rope the more the force is divided in the system we have a motor which revolves this is the driver and this is the driven this is the input this is the output this is the master this is the slave three different words for the same we have a small diameter of radius or diameter and we have a larger radius and diameter so this needs to turn twice in order to turn this once which means it gets a lot of force advantage which we call torque right this could possibly be explained a little bit better so I just want you to watch the little section of this video, if you will. Attach the pulley to my weight. Now I'm going to run my rope or my string through and attach the point above the weight. 
around. Instead of the pulley being up top, the pulley's now at the bottom. And we're going to try and lift this weight with a pulley at the bottom and see what happens on our spring scale. We're going to zoom in and take a closer look so you can see if our... And notice that this is a one kilogram weight. The work really is made easier by using our pulley differently. Right now our spring scale is reading zero grams. Down here is a thousand. Watch what happens carefully to our spring scale when I pull up. I pull up, the weight is off the table, but my spring scale didn't go down to a thousand. We're gonna zoom in and take a closer look. So we've zoomed in and we can see that our spring scale is right at 500 grams. I would say this pulley has made our work easier. In our it took the weight and it divided it between both sides of the wheel pulley and it resulted in only having to pull down 500 grams in order to pull up 1000 grams our last setup pretty it's amazing hi i'm jerry welcome to electro line now we're going now, I want to and show if you, you do that, a you can see that there's only one base when this object is here. being upheld, so and so therefore you know the pull or a rope going around. The pulley doesn't have any friction. Now, that's of course never the case. Pulley always has friction. There's always some moment of inertia. But if we can consider the, the, them to be so small that we can ignore them, then we don't have to worry about it. Now, listen and so me. in that case, if the tension here must be equal to the tension there, then the force here must be 100 newtons, and they have to be equal, so. So this is the fixed wheel pulley, okay? What you pull here, you must pull this. You don't get a mechanical advantage, but obviously if you pull at an angle and you can use your body weight, you get the advantage there. Therefore, it's 100 newtons. So there's no advantage as far as the amount of force required. You simply can redirect the force and it's easier because you can pull down on it to pull the object up rather than have to lift it up. On the second combination here, we have a second pulley. Again, if we draw a free body diagram around the pulley that holds the weight like this, you can now see that there's two cables or two ropes that are holding up the weight of that. And if we assume that the force or the tension is the same on both sides. And again, the reason why we can assume that is because that's one of the rules of pulleys, that if the pulley has no mass and no friction... Does anyone know? It basically links back to our original formula for force, which was mechanical advantage is equal to output over input. Right? Now, our mechanical advantage is how many times the work has been decreased. Well, fortunately for you, I can just tell you, the mechanical advantage is the amount of falls, ropes, some might call it the amount of pulleys, but it's also how the pulleys are rigged up, so we call it the amount of ropes that the weight is hanging on. So let's look at this little formula over here. What is our output to Newtons? What is our input? Well, we don't really know yet, right? What's our mechanical advantage? One, two, three, four. MA equals four. So, if MA equals output over input, then our input equals our output divided by our MA. Keep that triangle in your minds because it's very helpful. Output over input MA times input equals output. Because the more your advantage for your input, the bigger your output's going to be. So what is your input? It's how much effort you got out, which in this case, 2 newtons, divided by how much I managed to save, how much I had advantage, and we said it was times 4. So output 2 newtons, divided by your mechanical advantage, which is 4. My answer 
is 0.5 newtons. Awesome! I pull down with 0.5 newtons and I get 2 newtons. Four times the output that I put in. So we look back at your worksheet. The good news is that there are not going to be many, many sums when it comes to pulleys. The sums more come along when we're talking about gears later and the levers that we've already done and, of course, the pressure. Chapter 5, Worksheet B, asks you to draw a s So I took this rubber and I weighed it. And I saw that it weighed 20 grams. Then I took the rubber and notice that this is a ruler and this end here is basically where the fulcrum is. Now I took the rubber and I put it halfway and I weighed it. Now it weighs 10 grams. And if I put it over here, it weighs 15 grams. What do you think is happening? It's quite freaky. What's happening is the ruler is taking the weight of the rubber and it is sharing it. So the closer the eraser rubber was to the end, it had more force. And if this was a balanced fulcrum and I put the ruler there, I could balance the ruler in quite a weird way in that the ruler is balanced even though it's much longer on that side than it is on that side because of the weight. So the, the weight or the force and the distance must always be equal to the force of gravity and the distance. That is an equilibrium. And that is what I want you to start thinking about in technology. How does this work? How will I get an advantage here? Well, I'll get an advantage by moving the fulcrum this way. And now I'll have more leverage, etc. The same thing happens when I have a wedge or a hill. If I took two marbles and I rolled them down this inclined plane there, and at the same time I released one down this inclined plane, would they have the same speeds? Would they reach the earth at the same time? Because they started at the same height. Well, I believe that this one will travel faster. This one will take a longer time to get to the earth because it's got more distance to cover. So we can use this to our advantage. Remember, if this was an equal seesaw, then one meter with 100 newtons on it would balance another seesaw on the other side must be 2 meters with 50 newtons on it. Then we say they are in equilibrium. Force over distance equals force over distance. 50 times 1 is 50. 100 divided by 2 is 50. They are balanced. Now the same thing with the pulley. I wonder if you took even a single fixed pulley with 100 kilograms of titanium and you tried to pull it down here at this angle, then obviously we know, well, it's 100 must be this side, must be 100 this side. But what would happen if you extended the angle and you made a rope a kilometer long?
they have asked us to draw a single wheel fixed pulley. They've asked us to draw a single wheel movable or a block and tackle. The one in the middle is just as an example. So here's the single wheel fixed. Tension over here is the tension over here. So because the weight is 10 newtons coming down, we have to pull 10 newtons coming down. Sorry about that. With the block and tackle, the weight is suspended by two ropes. Here, it's only suspended by one rope. So it has 5 newtons this side and 5 newtons this side, as we can see. So how do we work this out now? How many wheels does a single wheel fixed have? One. How many wheels does the block and tackle have? Two or more. How many falls? In other words, how many pieces of rope are supporting the weight? One. How many falls here? One, two. Halves the work needed to do. Okay? And the mechanical advantage? Well, that we can work out. We don't have an actual mechanical advantage here. It's one on one, or it's actually a zero mechanical advantage. Now, please note, the mechanical advantage of this is the amount of falls that we have. And we've got two. So our mechanical advantage here is 2. Not really the number of pulleys, in this case it was, but actually, as I said earlier, the number of falls. Right? Now let's go back to the next sum, number 4. I don't answer the ones that are in the memo that are easy to answer for yourselves. We have... 1,000 newtons pulling down here and we want to work out what the mechanical advantage is. She's pulling 500 newtons. Well done. I think she needs a little bit of blonde hair. I can't just have the city hair like this. Come on. Really? Mm, lovely. And what we're going to do is we're going to work out how many falls are supporting the weight two falls well done so our mechanical advantage is going to be two where are you going granny so if i'm putting in a thousand newtons of weight here output divided by two my input will be 500 newtons so you can see how they save a lot of work not so So what I do is I diffuse. I've done the drawing. I've got my information. Now let me just show you something. If I know that force 1 over area 1 must equal force 2, sorry about that, over area 2, it's a cross multiplication. So I find it easier to go force 1 times area 2 equals area 1 times force 2. Now that makes sense because we know that the two sides must equal. Now what are we looking for? We're looking for the input, which is force 1. I want that. So, how do I get rid of A2? Well, if I divide by A, the area, it cancels out. What I do on one side, I obviously have to do on the other side. So there's my formula. If I want to find the force, I must times the area of 1 times the force of 2 divided by the area of 2. 
and that will give me my force. So times the area by the force and we end up with 272,58 newtons. And to me that's amazing because you've got 3,000 newtons out of the deal. Isn't that great? Right, now we have a car brake system which also has an input and an output cylinder. Pressure equals pressure. Well, we applied a force of 128 newtons and we resulted in a force of 325 newtons, which is great because when you're pushing brakes, you want to exert a lot of force so you can stop the car. Not so. Well, the area of the force one should be smaller than the area of force two. So the small force comes in here and it goes into a bigger force. Force one over area one equals force two over area two. And just as we did in the previous sum, how do we find out area two? Well, we say area 2 times force 1 equals area 1 times force 2. And we solve the sum. And we end up with 16.61 square centimeters. And as we see, 16.61 is smaller is greater than 6.54. Right, let's move on to chapter 4, target worksheet A. Same to do with pressure. Number 1 to 6, you can do short answers yourselves. Same thing I did, I diffused it. Draw the question. Find the information that you need. Which formula are we going to use? What units do we need? Then we solve it and we express an answer. So, we have a hydraulic press. The input is over here. 35 newtons pushing against 245 newton output. Wow! And it's punching holes into this little piece of metal here. So, we want to work out what the mechanical advantage is. We put in 35 newtons, we got our 245. What is mechanical advantage? Mechanical advantage is output over input. What's my output? 245 newtons, write it in darker, I just kept it light for you. And input 35, you divide it by each other, and what answer did you get? Looks to me like 35 goes into 245 around about seven times. Cool. So your answer for that one will be a little seven. Well done. Let's go down to 7.2. We have an input pushing into an output. And we have a mechanical advantage. Always keep the formulas you need handy. If I were you, I'd learn all these formulas because this, this is where the life of technology lies, in the heart. This is the heart of technology, right in front of you. Now, we're talking about the area of the piston. So, the input radius is 0.75 millimeters. So, I'm sure you can remember what we talked about earlier, that your radius is from the center to the end, right? And the diameter would be from the end to the end of a circle, 
right through the center. So if a circle is four times greater, or if a cylinder is four times greater, you times the radius by four, or you times the diameter by four, because the radius is half of the diameter. So it'll work into the same ratio. So my input ratio, 0 0.75 millimeters squared. Ah, millimeters, sorry. Times it by four to get my output ratio, 0 0.75 times four ends up being three millimeters. So I want to work out the area of this piston versus the area of this piston. What is the formula for area? Pi r squared. Remember pi is not is three comma one four one five nine two six five three five eight nine seven nine three two three eight four six two etc. But thank goodness we keep pi at being simply three point one four. Okay, three point one four. So pi r squared will be three point one four times nine. And that will be the area of the output. And the input will be 3.14 times 0.75 squared. So let's see what that answer will be over there. Right, so the area of the output cylinder is pi r squared, which means that it is 3.14 times its radius, which was 3 millimeters. Right, that equals, and then over here, we'll do that later, 3.14 times its radius, which was 0, 0.75 millimeters squared, squared, which is 9, 3.14 times 9 millimeters squared equals 3.14 times What's 0 0.75 millimeters squared looks like? And we get that answer over there. Okay. Looks like a 1.0625 millimeters squared. Calculate a bit slower. Sorry about that. Right, so my area here, 28.26 millimeters squared out my area here 1,767 millimeters squared now how do I work about my MA output divided by input 767 my answer is 16 times my mechanical advantage is 16 awesome and likewise, 7.3 and 7.4 are very similar. We've got our input is our output over our mechanical advantage. We really know that our mechanical advantage is 6. People keep these formulas in mind. So my output is 780 newtons. My MA, my mechanical advantage is 6. Divide the two and my answer is 130 newtons. 130 newtons needed to pull up 780 newtons. What an awesome pulley system. 7.4, how do I work out my mechanical advantage? It's out over in. I was wondering to see whether you would notice that. 120 over 12, the mechanical advantage is 10. But the good news is we're on to our last worksheet. Yay! So, we have an input of 70 millimeters squared, and we have an output of, we're not sure, so we've got to work it out. So, I said, my mechanical advantage they gave us was 3. So, obviously, 
output area must equal input area divided by mechanical advantage. So our output is our mechanical advantage, which is 3 times our area is 3 times 70, which is 210 millimeters squared. There we go. Easy. Now let's go to number 3. This is the input piston. And it's narrower. So when it goes that distance, it will only travel a shorter distance on the output because it has more force. So we say that the mechanical advantage was output over input, which is 8. Right? So, we take our input distance, we divide by the mechanical advantage, and we get, it goes up by 50 centimeters. You see, you go a long way down because it's thin, and only a short way up. So you lose height, but you gain force. Eight times more force. Number four is a little bit more difficult. Now, if we look carefully, they want to know what the pressure is when the direction is A, and they want to know what the pressure is when the pressure is in the direction of B. Now, visualize this. Okay. We're talking about the force that that piston is pushing in the cylinder in A. Small, too big. In the other sum B, we're talking about what the pressure is going in this direction when we take the big cylinder a piston pushing to a smaller area. You got it? Now, we've got to work out the radius because the radius will help us determine the area, pi r squared. Well, they gave us a diameter and we know that in a diameter we have two radiuses or radii. So, the radius for the small is 6 millimeters. And the radius for the large is 20 millimeters. The pressure throughout is 0,4 pascals. And we know this famous pressure must equal pressure. Right. So, when we do all the calculations, we carry on. Right. So, we're working out the force at direction A. Force in direction A. Okay. Force equals pressure times area naught comma four pascals times area which is pi r squared correct which equals naught comma four pascals times pi keep your brackets times r squared which is 2 centimeters squared, which is 4 square centimeters. Correct? And you carry on with your sum, and you end up with, well, 20 times 20 is 400, sorry, not 4, which is 400. I was working in centimeters, millimeters. 502.4 newtons. That is because we have a small force pushing a big force and it results in a great advantage. Now at B, what happens when we have a large cylinder pushing against a small cylinder? We are going to lose some of our force. Same thing. Take your pressure times your area which is 3.14. Make sure that you keep your units because I went on to centimeter squared by mistake there. 
36 square millimeters, 0.5 times 113 equals 45 newtons. So do you see in the same system, when it's going this direction, it's got 502 newtons, and in this direction, 45 newtons. Amazing mechanical advantage. Number five is easy enough to see. We had a greater output than an input. So our output was 200 newtons divided by the input, which was 50 newtons. And if you ask me, 50 goes into 200 four times. So the answer for number five, the mechanical advantage is a big resounding quadrupled four. And that's really great. Right, people. So that brings us to the end of our lesson. And I hope you are working hard at home. Go through the sums together. And just remember, diffuse each sum that you do. Draw it. Get all the information you need. Find which formula you want. And then you solve it. And you express it as an answer. So, fortunately for you, there's not much homework to do, but I'd like you to read up on the section on gears. And um, as you do that, you'll prepare for lesson four. Thank you very much.